The Lord of the Rings The Return of the King is a game with an endless amount of nostalgia and pleasant memories for people. Developed in 2004, this game takes place during the movie that was produced by New Line Cinema under the same name. There are four different versions of this game. PS2, Nintendo GameCube, Xbox, and PC. Now, for some reason, this game's PC and the other console versions have some distinct differences. These differences make the speedrun on every version that is not the PC version more difficult. Now why would this be? Well, let's dive in and let's take a look at how I got the world record on the hardest version of The Return of the King any percent. The Return of the King is a unique speedrun in that it has three different paths that the player must complete in order to unlock the final level. Those three paths are the Path of the Wizard, the Path of the King, and the Path of the Hobbit. Each path follows a separate character with their own unique abilities, and the player must complete each of these different paths in order to unlock the final level, the Crack of Doom. This creates a unique routing opportunity for the Return of the King speedrun as we get to decide which path we want to take, and sometimes we can even partially complete a path before moving on to a different one. In this specific video in my own personal routing, I will be choosing the path of the wizard, first going all the way through it, then going back down and going all the way through the path of the hobbit, and then finishing up with the path of the king, in order to knock out as many levels that have the biggest RNG variables throughout the game. For those who do not know, RNG stands for random number generation, which is a portion of the game that is completely randomized and almost out of the player's control. So you'll be hearing me refer to RNG a lot throughout the run because it does play a major factor in how my time got to where it is. To start off this run, we select new game and have to sit through an intro cutscene that lasts about three and a half minutes. Timer begins once we gain control of Gandalf. This can become a huge struggle when you are speedrunning this game because if you have to reset then you have to sit through this entire cutscene before you can proceed throughout the rest of the run. When we start in Helm's Deep, we have 45 seconds where we can go through and kill as many enemies as we can. So we'd use this time to get as much EXP as possible so that way we can hit level 3 by the end of this level. There's nothing really too interesting about this part other than Wizard Magic Attack Go Burr. By the end of this auto scroller, we'll be activating Gendup's unique ability, which is a shield that makes him invulnerable from damage as well as any enemy that we run into will be damaged. This allows us to run past all of these enemies and up to the ladder without having to take any damage or fight any of these enemies. When we get to the top of the wall, we have to take out all of the ranged enemies. But this is where this level can become a little tricky because we cannot do it too quickly. If we take out these enemies too fast, it will create a weird glitch that will softlock our game and prevent us from continuing for about 25 seconds. Usually if this happens, we end up just restarting because nobody wants to start their speedrun 30 seconds behind. I decided to play it a little bit safe and make sure that this cutscene plays, so that way I know I didn't have to worry about resetting. Once we get this trigger, then the small cutscene will happen, we climb down the wall and trigger each of these different ballistas to end the level. At the end of the level, the game teaches us about all of our XP and how we can spend our AXP to buy certain upgrades. Each of these different upgrades will make our characters stronger, thus allowing us to proceed through the game faster. This game has a unique property as well in that it introduces what's known as a fellowship upgrade. We can either spend our EXP to buy an upgrade for just the individual character, or we can buy a fellowship upgrade. The fellowship upgrade is a little bit more expensive, but it applies that upgrade to every single character regardless if we have played as them or not. All we have to do is just get them to the level that the uh, that ability is under. I buy Wizard's Power, which will increase the duration of my damage shield, as well as make it last a little bit longer. Light of the Pilgrim, which increases my damage for my ranged magic attack. And a Fellowship or Cure, which is a main combo that we'll be using throughout the entire game that consists of two speed attacks and a fierce attack. I'll explain a little bit more about some of these abilities as they become more relevant later on in the run. After this, I pers purposely save my game and restart my console. This skips an unskippable cutscene that we would normally have to sit through at the start of every single run. 
but this way we can skip it and move on to the next level much quicker. The next level that we'll be diving into is the road to Isengard. After we sit through a minute and a half of an unskippable cutscene, we enter the level. At the start of the level, I want to kill every single enemy that is not an archer. This is because there is a large section of enemies where I need more to spawn. If I do not kill all of the enemies before, then not as many enemies will spawn where I need them to. Once I get to the part where the ends smash these two orcs together, the chaos begins. To progress this section of the level, I need to kill 75 enemies. This is one major portion of RNG in this run, as enemies can come in at different rates. And the Ents that walk around can run into us and knock us down, which prevents us from doing us what we need to do. Unfortunately, I get a little bit trolled by the Ents and lose about 10 seconds, but we continue on with the run as it is not a run killer. Yet. We proceed to the end of the level where we avoid destroying the towers in order to prevent the archers at the end from spawning. Once we get to the dam, we can kill the berserker and shoot the dam to deal extra damage and end the level. Unless we hit level 5 in this level, we will forego any upgrades and move on to the next level, Minas Tirith Top of the Wall. Before we get into this next level, I want to take a quick note to mention that this is my own personal upgrade route. Other runners will use slightly different upgrades and I recommend checking their runs out to see the paths they take. The runners that I am primarily mentioning here are Maxilobes, Dino95 HD, Yamada, PJ Arts of Darkness, and Rubidal, as they are the most active runners in this game at this point in time. Another quick note before we get into our next level, I want to take this time to let you guys know that many of you who are watching these videos are not currently subscribed to my channel. So if you're enjoying the content that you're watching, please do consider subscribing and leaving a comment. It helps to support the channel and helps me to keep making Lord of the Rings content like this video that you're seeing here, as well as some other things that you can see on the channel that are all getting talked about and uploaded. So please do consider subscribing and hit that bell so that way more of you guys can see the videos as they get uploaded. The next level begins with a three and a half minute auto scroller. If you don't know what an auto scroller is, it is a period of time where the game has to hit a certain point before it will actually be able to progress. It is impossible to save time during any of these sections. In this level, you will see up in the top right corner that there is a map that demonstrates all the different ladders. And it also has a reinforcement count, which is that red circle that's filling up. That red circle fills up, our wall has become overran, and we will fail the level. And then, as time progresses, red dots will appear on the map, and that is where the ladders will be appearing throughout the wall. After three and a half minutes of kicking down ladders and preventing the enemies from being able to overrun the wall, our siege towers are going to begin spawning. And this is where the auto scroller then comes to an end. What we have to do is we have to run to these very specific points on the wall to be able to do four charge shots against our siege towers that are spawning. There are two distinct differences in range attacks in this game. There's a quick shot and a charge shot. A quick shot will be shooting faster, but does less damage. A charge shot will do more damage, but it takes longer to charge up. The siege towers take four charge shots before they are taken down. Once we take down three of these siege towers, a fourth siege tower will purposely land on the wall and will be resetting the reinforcement count. This one will also take significantly less damage before it gets destroyed. So we head over to it, four quick shots destroy the siege tower, thus causing the end of the level, unlocking the staircase that we can then go down to reach the end. At the end of the level, we will be hitting level 5, and we will be picking up our final upgrade for Gandalf, Light of the Forges. It is another ranged upgrade, and will not only do extra range attack damage on our quick shots, but it will also set our enemies on fire, which will become really useful when we get to the Black Gate later on in the run. The next level we are going to be getting into is the biggest RNG portion of this run, and it is Minas Tirith Courtyard. Courtyard is also one of the longer levels in this run, but we divide it up into four different sections because this level is a very unique way to finish it. To finish this level, we have to save 200 refugees, and the refugees are these women that will be running across the courtyard to get to our back gate. Now, we're going to be having to use our various abilities to keep the enemies at bay. We don't necessarily have to kill them, but we don't want the enemies to be doing a lot of damage to our refugees, preventing them from getting to the gate. There are certain periods within the level 
where the spawns will shift depending on how many refugees you have in total. The checkpoints that we have set up as runners are 50, 100, 150, and then our final 200. This kind of helps us to get an idea of how good the run is going because this level can shift very quickly from a really good courtyard to a really bad courtyard or vice versa. A lot of times the game will just decide to make you lose a lot of time. Upwards of about a minute and a half to two minutes. This is why I run Path of the Wizard right at the beginning of the run because I can knock this level out of the way especially with having to deal with a level like this where your entire run can die and it's not your fault. I want to be able to force it out of my way so that way I don't have to worry about it later on and possibly lose too much time at the end of the run. I'm not going to go into too much detail about how this level exactly works because otherwise we're going to be here for a long time, especially considering that we as a community still do not quite have this level figured out. Thankfully, by the end of this level, I didn't lose enough time to warrant losing the run. There were some periods where this level could have gone better, but it was certainly passable, and that's all that I needed in order to get the world record. At the end of this level, we, we are concluding the Path of the Wizard and moving on to our next path, the Path of the Hobbit. We don't need to get any more upgrades for Gandalf as he is as strong as we need him to be in order to get through the next level that we use him in. But we won't be getting there for a while. Now that we have concluded on the Path of the Wizard, we're going to be moving on to the Path of the Hobbit. The Path of the Hobbit is unique in that instead of having a lot of RNG levels, the Path of the Hobbit is very difficult execution wise, and the main difference between this is the fact that the Hobbits are very squishy and so it is really easy to die, and this becomes especially more relevant in the console version than in the PC version of the game. For some reason, you don't take nearly as much damage on the PC version as you do in the console version. The first level that we are doing is Escape from Osgiliath. Now, there are a few things that we're going to have to take care of before we can exit the level, and that is to be getting a little bit of EXP, so that way by the end of the level, we will be level 2, which is very important for the fighting in Shelob in the next level. The biggest gimmick with this level is up in the top right corner, there is a meter that you can see with the Fell Beast icon. If that meter fills up all the way red, then we will fail the level. If that meter does not fill up, then we are safe. Anytime that we are inside a building or on lower ground, that meter does not fill up and will actually be fading away to help reset that timer. Anytime that we are up higher on a roof or we are really exposed to the sky, then that meter will begin filling up. Since we are speedrunners though, this meter doesn't really matter too much and we can just make our way up to the whole level without having to worry about anything. So I make my way through the level, climbing up every single ladder, climbing down all the ladders that we need to, and push the bell and make it through the level relatively okay. We have a few moments here and there where we get hit by some enemies, but overall, an Osgiliath that is very passable in a run. The next level we'll be going through is Shelob's Lair. Shelob's Lair is one of the most difficult levels in the entire run. It is the biggest run killer for newer runners. This level has a lot of difficult movement, as well as the final boss for this level is very difficult to be able to fight optimally. She can do a lot of damage and kill you quickly if you do not know the strategies on how to take her down. This level is also where we will be seeing some of the major differences between the PC and the console version. There is a trick in this level where we can skip through these pits of spiders just by jumping backwards through them. On the PC version of the game in single player, every single one of these spider pits do not do any damage to us. However, on the console version, some of them are going to be doing even more damage and can possibly reduce our health down very quickly making the rest of the run extraordinarily risky, or just killing us outright. This is another area where even the different consoles have their own differences. On the Xbox port of this game, there is more damage in spider pits than there are in the GameCube version, as well as on the Xbox port, the spider pits have a slightly more extended hitbox. This is why I am playing on the GameCube version. The GameCube version does not have as nearly as many of these damaging spider pits and it makes Shelob about 45 seconds faster. But because of this, I play on a Nintendo Wii despite losing a little bit of time to load times. Throughout the rest of this level, I use my various tools to be able to move through the level, throwing torches and getting rid of spiders that could possibly be in my way. As I'm getting rid of these spiders, I'm also taking much care in order to avoid taking damage so that way I have as much help as possible when we get to fighting Shelob. Doing the Shelob fight is a lot more complicated 
than a lot of people would give it credit for. At the very start of the fight, I'm going to be running up behind Shelob and executing an Orc Hewer. This is that combo that we bought at the beginning of Helm's Deep that I talked about at the beginning of the run. It is something that we use very common in order to get into perfect mode quickly, but it also does a lot of damage to Shelob. All it is is doing two spirit attacks and, two and a fierce attack. On my GameCube controller that comes out to the button combo AAY. At the end of each phase, Shelob is going to climb up on the wall to avoid getting hit and she will then be summoning some of her little baby spiders to try and fight us. Thankfully, if we throw some of our daggers up onto Shelob, she will be forced to come down and fight us again. Normally, you would have to kill all of the baby spiders that are around before she would be able to come down. In this run, our fight becomes a little hectic and we almost die in a couple of spots, but we manage to make it through. Thankfully, this is where I had some of my biggest time save, and because of that, even though I was behind going into this level, I'm able to bring it back and put myself into a pretty substantial lead getting ready to the next level. The next level we're going into is Kiddith Ungle. In this next level, we have to kill 80 orcs, and because we are hobbits, hobbits have slower and clunkier attacks, so we don't want to take a lot of time directly fighting orcs. So instead, there's going to be a lot of moments throughout this level where I will not be directly fighting them, but instead using these little fire pits to be able to deal a lot of damage to the orcs and kill them quickly as I move through the tower. At around the halfway point, I'm going to be in this room where there's essentially a big mosh pit of orcs that are going to be fighting each other. I make my way up the stairs to be able to drop this pot of oil down into a group of orcs, taking out a lot of them, and then continuing to make my way up the stairs where I throw a couple of spears and kill the orc captain, and then I drop the chandelier on the mosh pit, putting me at around 60 orcs before I even hardly had to fight any. I continue to make my way through the rest of the level, drop this drawbridge down under the enemies, and then make my way up where I push the exploding barrel, and by that point I have reached the 80 mark and can proceed to the end of the level. This is an area of the game that will not be accessible unless you have to take down all 80 orcs. I make my way up the ramp, shoot the ballista, and make my way into the boss fight for this level. The next fight can be very annoying, as Gorbag is only able to take damage if we are able to hit him with two spears to stun him. Once I hit him with those spears, he will be stunned for a short period of time, in which I will try to knock him down on the ground and use my finishing move to stab him as many times as possible. Thankfully, I am able to do this pretty quickly and Gorbag only fights me a little bit, which is pretty typical in, his, in most runs. I finish off this boss fight, and that ends the Path of the Hobbit. And just like that, I'm now sitting at a very, very comfortable lead as I head into my favorite portion of the run, the Path of the King. The Path of the King is a portion of the run where there are multiple different ways that you could possibly go about it. This is the only area in the single player run where you have access to more than one character. In Path of the Wizard, you can only play as Gandalf, and in the Path of the Hobbit, you can only play as Sam. But in Path of the King, you have the option to be able to play as Aragorn, Legolas, or Gimli. The fastest character in the single player run is Legolas because he has the strongest range attack and that is going to be able to pull off a couple of really important boss quick kills in two different levels. In fact, Legolas's bow is so overpowered that we use it pretty much throughout the entirety of this path and it becomes our primary way of attacking enemies. The first level in the Path of the King is the Path of the Dead. This is also my favorite level throughout the entire speedrun. It has so many cool movement tech, as well as some really awesome fight strategies that we're able to pull off. While it may seem that some of these fights are pretty straightforward, the timing that is required to use the bow to its maximum potential is actually quite difficult to get used to. We're starting off the level by moving out through this fog. Once we get into the fog, the game forces us to be in a walking animation. However, if we turn around and we use our jump back ability, we are able to move through the fog significantly faster than how the game would force us to go. We skip through the first fight and make our way to the second fight, where this rock will be blocking our path and a bunch of the ghosts will be spawning. We defeat them by using our bow with some very specific timing so that way they're able to die as soon as they spawn. The charge shots will one shot every single ghost, and after defeating all seven of them, we're able to fog hop our way to the next fight, which is actually quite a ways away. And in order to get there, we have a few different movement areas. But since we know the fastest route, we're able to stick to it, taking tight turns and make our way through the fog to the drawbridge and all the way to the next fight. 
The second fight is similar to the first one in that we have to use very tight quick shot or charge shots in order to kill all the different ghosts. This is also where we are introduced to a ghost captain. Captains are enemies that have their own health bar and typically deal a lot more damage. Ghost captains are different than orc captains because in order to defeat an orc captain, they have an armor that you have to break. But ghost captains don't have any armor. So we're able to defeat them by doing two charge shots and a quick shot that end this fight very quickly. We then push the statue, open the gate, and make our way to our final fight. Our final fight is a forced fight where we have to defeat 35 ghosts. This fight is the main decider on how well that your Paths of the Dead can go at an optimal level. This fight can get quickly out of hand if your arrows do not hit their mark. I place myself in the arena so that way I can defeat the enemies as quickly as they spawn. The only downside to this fight is that I do not have the arrow count in order to take them all out by one quiver of arrows. I had to make some adjustments mid-fight in order to make sure that I was still able to defeat the enemies quickly, in which I used Legolas' special ability, called Devastating Mode. This allows me to be able to do extra damage and get into perfect mode quickly, which helps me to take out enemies. If I'm ever in perfect mode, which is where you see that blue sphere by my health glowing blue, and there is this blue mist coming from my character. That means that I get the maximum amount of EXP as well as do the maximum amount of melee damage by going into perfect mode. I can take out enemies very quickly which allows me to get through the rest of this fight despite not having the arrows. After this fight, I proceed to the end of the level and purchase the bow upgrade, Mirkwood Arrows, in order to make my bow attack slightly stronger as we get into the next level, the King of the Dead. Not a gold, but still a very, very, very good Paths of the Dead. The King of the Dead features a really, really tough boss fight at the very start of the level. We start off the fight by running down to the corner and trying to do four charge shots before the King of the Dead phases all the way into the ground. As long as we get all four charge shots and then get a stab off before he phases into the ground, we get the amount of damage that we need. If we do not get that fourth shot off, the entire fight is ruined. Once the King of the Dead phases into the ground, he will then summon his four minions that we can take all of them out using charge shots. After we defeat the minions with the charge shots, we will run all the way back and manipulate the King of the Dead to spawn as far back as possible. With this, we will do one charge shot, then we do three quick shots, and then we do three more charge shots to end this phase. Once this phase is ended, we have to make sure to get a stab off and do one more really difficult charge shot before the King of the Dead phases into the ground. Otherwise, once again, this strat does not work. After we take out the two groups of archers, we will once again do the same strategy that we've done before. We do one charge shot, three quick shots, and then do two more charge shots. With this, the King of the Dead will transition into his Wind of the Mountain phase. You'll get this short little cutscene and then he will use that attack. After he uses that attack, we get as close as we can to him and do a bunch of charge shots until the King of the Dead is, well, dead. If not, then we could possibly be getting another minion phase. Thankfully, I'm able to execute this fight and get a massive gold split by about 30 seconds. This is easily the fastest I had ever completed this fight in a run. After this fight, the next section is Falling Rocks. We have to maneuver backwards through the Paths of the Dead level with a few areas cut off to make it a little bit shorter, and then do some really chaotic fights quickly. During the movement phases, if we are not moving quickly enough, the Falling Rocks behind us will kill us instantaneously and force us to restart this section over again. Each of these fights are very chaotic, so it can be very easy to lose a lot of time. Thankfully, they end up being not too terribly hectic, I do have a few moments where I lose a little bit of time, but overall, I'm very happy with this, and I finish up King of the Dead at 25 seconds ahead of my fastest pace ever. This is all thanks to being able to get that King of the Dead quick kill strat, because it's the first time I was able to get it on console. After that, we move into our next level, the Southern Gate, or as we like to call it in our community, the Orc Mosh Pit. We will start this level off by running to the gate and triggering the orcs and a troll to spawn. Once the troll is spawned, we run over to the quickest spear and throw it at the troll in order to one-shot the troll. 
From there, we can run over to the two different catapults on the left to try and trigger the next part of the level. This part can be very difficult and can be a little inconsistent as there are so many enemies around and we don't want to take the f time to fight them because, well, that's an unnecessary amount of time. However, if the enemies hit us too much, we can possibly die and lose the run. Once we trigger all the catapults, we can make our way to the gate itself. Fight another troll up on top of the gate using our range attacks and hiding behind the wall so that way the troll doesn't have to do any damage to us. Once the troll is dead, he is going to be spawning in an Oliphant that we're going to have to destroy. The Oliphant takes 4 charge shots in order to kill it. And then from there, we open up the gate. All throughout this time, we have to be careful because the orcs will be trying to attack us and preventing us from being able to do what we need to do. It can also bring our health dangerously low and put us at risk of dying. And if we die here, the run is over. After a few close calls, I manage to get the gate open and the gate guards come running out. I drop the oil buckets on them and then run back through the gate to end the level. Overall, this level goes great and I finish this off with another gold split helping to increase my lead going into the next level, Eleanor Fields. That means this is a gold, baby! Let's freaking go! <laughs> Eleanor Fields is another major RNG level in this run. This level is one reason why I have contemplated swapping my route over to doing Path of the King before doing Path of the Hobbit just to be able to get through this level faster. At the start of the level, we will have to run over to the left side and take out 60 enemies. Since there is only about 20 minutes left in the run, it is imperative that the RNG goes as good as it possibly can. We fight these 60 enemies by using our bow. However, this can be very difficult to do properly, as we only have a limited amount of arrows. Once our arrows run out, or when we start to get low, we have to reposition and hope that we can get an arrow drop and get our arrows refilled quickly. Another thing that we have to be paying attention to is that we have to watch for enemies that could possibly be approaching us to try and attack us. If the enemies attack us, then we won't be able to use our bow to kill them. We will have to use a melee attack which takes more time. Unfortunately, this is where some disaster strikes in the run. The enemies tended to avoid my arrows and were not dying as quickly as I needed them to be, especially comboed with a few unlucky arrow drops, but mostly bad enemy behavior, this resulted in a loss of around 30 seconds. From here, the level advances to where we have to take down two elephants. Once we take down these oliphants, we will then be fighting the Witch King. Thankfully, we can hit the elephants, the oliphants from far enough away where we don't have to worry about them being annoying to us. After we destroy these Oliphants, we will have to fight the Witch King, in which we complete the Witch King 1 cycle. This fight overall can be pretty easy to pull off. However, if RNG does not go your way, this fight can go pretty horribly wrong. I had a fight in a previous PB attempt that caused me to not only fail the Witch King 1 cycle, but I also died and lost the run. All we have to do to execute this fight is to wait for the Witch King to attack Mary and Eowyn, and then we shoot 4 charge shots into the Witch King in order to win. I got a little close here as there was one orc that tried to ruin it, but thankfully we were able to get the one cycle and keep the run going. And with this, we say goodbye to Legolas as we go once again to our boy Gandalf as we go into the penultimate level in the run, the Black Gate. The Black Gate is another chaotic level that can be full of high amounts of RNG. In this level we are going to be playing as Gandalf as he is easily the strongest character we will be starting off this level by fighting the Mouth of Sauron. I'm sure if you played this game as a kid, you have a lot of memories of the Mouth of Sauron being very obnoxious. But thankfully, as long as we spam our or cure, we can keep him stunlocked and we don't have to worry about him at all. We can get into perfect mode as well to deal a significant more amount of damage and take him out quickly. After this, the mob breaks out and the gate will open and enemies will be pouring in at almost all times. We will be using our bubble attack, as well as a lot of various orc cures to be able to deal with enemies very quickly. To spawn the captains in this level, because the goal of this mob is to defeat 6 captains. For the first chunk we have to kill enemies and the captains, or 3 of them, and they will all be spawning throughout the same area. 
I'm able to cleave them quickly and move on to where the level splits. The level splits into three different areas, so enemies will be pouring in from all three sides, making it significantly more chaotic. Once we get control of Gandalf again, we immediately run over to the right hand side and throw two spears at the captain, killing him instantly. That immediately gives us one without having to worry about a fight now. From here on out, I'm going to be using a bunch of range attacks because I want to make sure that I can get a drop by the end of the captains as I will need as many arrows as possible to defeat the ring race at the end of the level. After we take out five captains, there are going to be a group of two captains that come in. One of these captains, if we kill him, does not affect our overall captain count. We call him Chad. Thankfully, by the use of my bubble attack, I was able to take out Chad and the other captain quickly so that way we did not have to worry about him in the ring wraith fight. In the ring wraith fight, this is where that light of the forges becomes an absolutely key ability. All I need to do, because the ring wraiths are weak to fire, is just spam this attack and the ring wraiths all die very very quickly. Even though we lose a little bit of time, we are able to go into the final level, the crack of doom, at a very good pace. I don't care about a 129 chat. Now you may be thinking, you're really far ahead going into the crack of doom. This run must be pretty sealed in the bag. That is where you would be wrong. The crack of doom can be one of the most infuriating levels in the entire game, as Gollum is the most random person that you would ever have to encounter. In order to complete the level, you have to bait Gollum over to the edge of the arena, hit him with a few speed attacks to cause him to be stuck on the ledge, then hit him with a fierce attack for him to fall backwards, and then you stab him to knock him down. The first phase goes off relatively well, but in the second phase, this is where disaster ultimately strikes, and from this point on, I am absolutely terrified of whether or not I am even going to be able to pull off this world record. Gollum. Good. No, that's not good. Come here. Gollum dances around, hits me with some attacks, and goes all around the arena without being where I need him to be. Once I'm able to finish off the second phase, this is where I'm able to start doing a manipulation in order to make Gollum do what I need him to do. And you can even execute this manip at home. After the second phase, to execute the manip, you want to run over to where the arena meets the bridge. Once you hear Gollum growling, you will know that he will spawn over on the other side. You can run back over to where he spawns, hit him once with your dagger, and then you want to run over to the edge. He will jump at you, you dodge that, hit him with a speed attack, and then hit him with a fierce attack to knock him down and stab him again. Unfortunately, because of that one phase that went poorly, I lost about 45 seconds, but thankfully, I managed to keep my composure well enough to execute the manip in the remaining phases and finish the run with a new world record time of 1 hour, 30 minutes, and 52 seconds. It's over. We did it! I don't care! We freaking did it! <laughs> oh my god! There's a mug of beer inside this tuke. This beat the previous world record that was set by Maxi Lobes with a time of 1 hour, 31 minutes, and 2 seconds. For me, this resulted in a 41 second PB, and I was very happy to achieve this time. While there were many moments in this run that can definitely be improved upon, there's still a lot of moments that went very well. The console version of The Return of the King can be very difficult to get an optimized time in as it is very punishing and the moments of bad RNG can ultimately ruin your run throughout any point of the run. This run is super fun and I highly recommend anybody who has been possibly thinking about running this game. I'm very happy with this run and I'm very happy to put my console time down for now. I may return to it in the future, but who knows? We will see where this game goes in the meantime. But for now, I return to my PC port to try and lower my time in any percent no cutscenes. If you want to continue to watch my journey throughout this game, feel free to follow me on Twitch. That should be linked down below. Otherwise, if you enjoyed watching this video, thank you for watching. 
Please continue to subscribe and like the video as well as comment down below if there is a different Lord of the Rings speed game that you would like for me to cover in this way. Next, I'll be posting a lot more Lord of the Rings content in the coming months and years, especially as I continue my journey as a Lord of the Rings speedrunner. Thank you guys for watching again, and I will see you all next time.